hyperplanes. <clears throat> a mid cube, so now I'm going to, I apologetically told you that we're not going to care so much about the cat zero metric, even though we're, we're going to be interested in cat zero cube complexes. Right? And, and I said we we're going to move towards more combinatorial way of, of thinking about things. Um, <clears throat> the objects that it turns out uh, we're going to care about are hyperplanes. Um, uh, a, and and I'm, I'm going to start by, by defining them. Uh, a, a hyperplane in a, a, a mid cube in a, um, a mid cube is a uh, subspace um, that you get by restricting one coordinate to one half. So for instance, in this three cube right over here, which we're going to conveniently identify with the product of three intervals, if we, I, I, um, if we, ident if we restricted one of the coordinates to a half, then we'd get that mid cube over there. And there's two other mid cubes in that three cube. And well, maybe in this two cube, there's that mid cube right over here. And in, in this one cube, there's that mid cube right over there. You all know what mid cubes are now. A hyperplane in a cat zero cube complex, which I will call x tilde to remind you that it's simply connected, non-positively curved cube complex, is a subspace which is built from mid cubes in the following way. It's a connected subspace whose intersection with each cube is either empty or an entire mid cube of that cube. Okay, so maybe I'll get a picture in here. Um, of a <coughs> of a hyperplane, or maybe a few. So bear with me for a moment. I really need so much clutter over here. Maybe not. All right. So here's a, um, a non, I think it's a simply connected, non-positively curved cube complex, right? Is it, anybody check that it's a cat zero cube complex? You, you, you inspected all the links of zero cubes. And let's try to find a hyperplane. And let's do it in a suggestive way that kind of is going to help us understand what, what these things are. So let's start at a mid cube right over here, this orange mid cube right over there. And, and what are the rules? The rules are that if you intersect a cube, 
in a non, if, you, if, you, if you have non, if your orange object, your hyperplane, has non-empty intersection with the cube, then, th then actually it, the, the, you, your intersection has to be an entire mid-cube of that cube. And right now, our R cubes are all closed cubes, by the way. Right now, um, it, it intersects this two cube right over here at this point. But the rules are that you have to intersect at an entire mid cube. So I've extended it. Okay? Likewise, that, that two cube, right? And it's, it's still not a hyperplane now because notice that it intersects this three cube over here, it intersects it at a point. So it has to intersect it at an entire mid cube. And similarly for, for its neighboring 3 cube. Well, now I've got a hyperplane. Okay, let's, let's draw another one. I think you probably can, can do it yourselves now. Um, how about this yellow one right over here? There's a yellow hyperplane. And there's a, let's, let's see if green is visible on this board. Yes, no? No, yes, no. Red, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But you said that the cubes are not necessarily embedded. So when you say intersection, is it just a pullback or it's, uh, it should be the image of a? Well, it's just a subspace, so. Um, I don't know. I don't think I, I think I did anything wrong here. So um, 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 I have a an, an, uh, an, an object, and I have a a a, 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 a a a cube complex. And oh, I see your question. I understand. So his his he's what he's asking about is, well, um. It, do, 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 do cubes actually embed inside of a cat zero cube complex? Okay, so it, it turns out that every cube in a cat zero cube complex is going to embed. Okay, and so you're, you're going to be safe for certain concerns that you have. All right? We will, we will, we will get to that soon. Um, okay, so you see there are some other interesting hyperplanes, right? I don't have to draw more. Um, and in fact, uh, in fact, um, I think it's, it's not obvious. It was, uh, anybody who's thought of non-positively curved cube complexes uh, <coughs> was eventually led to hyperplanes. Um, uh, but I think Sagiv was, uh, I, I think he was first because it's, it's, it's tricky because there is, there's actually a literature on things like cube complexes called uh, median spaces that you know, precedes, precedes the topic from other area in math by uh, 70 years or so. Um, so it's hard to say if you know, people have been, been there already earlier since the, the group theorists are a little bit oblivious of, of, that, of that topic, although that's, that's changed in the last 10 years. Okay. Um, every... So this will, Credit to Sagiv. Every um, <coughs> mid cube um, lies in a hyperplane. Okay, so meaning every mid cube of a cube within our cat zero cube complex lies in a hyperplane. Let's call that hyperplane V. Um, this this hyperplane V, any hyperplane V separates X tilde in the sense that um, the cat zero cube complex minus V has two connected components. <coughs> Actually, even uh, stronger than that, what we call the carrier
n of v, which consists of um, of all the cubes, the union of all cubes intersecting v, all the cubes that contain its the cubes that contain that carry its mid cubes, has the property that it is isomorphic to a product of v and a one cube. This carrier of our hyperplane turns out to be a convex subcomplex. I'm going to talk about convexity um, later, but you, sh you can understand it for what it means. Right? The, any, any geodesic whose endpoints lie inside of it, lies inside of it. Right? And you know about the metric on, uh, <coughs> you know about the metric on uh, um, uh, cat zero spaces that I described already. I'm going to tell you about another metric in a, in a moment. Um, <coughs> it turns out that hyperplanes are what uh, give cat zero cube complexes um, their character. Right, and there are the, the world is filled with many cat zero spaces, many wonderful cat, uh, um, spaces that satisfy this ca this cat zero inequality, but. And, and cat zero cube complexes are among these spaces. But what really distinguishes them and makes them have extra wonderful features are these, these hyperplanes, these separating hyperplanes, right? And um, so uh, uh, let's see, some, some examples that you're familiar with of cat zero cube complexes. Trees are these simply connected one dimensional cat zero cube complexes. Right, and I already mentioned Euclidean space. Right, that's Euclidean two space over there, cut up into, into squares. And maybe the hyperbolic plane broken up into squares. Right, you've, I'm sure m m most of you have, have gone ahead and played a little game of tiling the, the, the plane by, by, by something. Right, and sort of see, see what you get, and you, you learn that you have to make the squares very tiny as you're going outwards. Right? Yeah. You get a nice, right, if you, if you have the, the tiling with five, with, with five squares meeting around each, each zero cube is, you know, my favorite. And, well, the hyperplanes in these uh, objects, well, the hyperplanes in the trees, you might not have noticed them because they're so, Small, they're just single points, the mid cubes of one of one of uh, edges, right? The hyperplanes uh, inside of your in, in, inside of the, the, the tiling of the plane, okay? Yeah, you know about them, but they're boring, right? And the hyperplanes uh, over here are seem just a little bit more interesting. Etc. Right, you kind of, you know, they they're going to look like some some nice circle arc of a circle that would intersect the boundary in the in the right way. If I drew this properly, right, you're all idealizing this picture. I hope. And uh, you're, you know, this this statement about the carrier looking about right to you now, so you know this uh, what's going on, and you already were inspecting, testing it against that cat zero cube complex over there as well. Okay. I need to, before I, I go on, I need to be a little bit honest about the, um, uh, about the, the metric that we're going to uh, focus on. Um, we just report that uh, in the theorem that the, the complex is uh, cat zero. Could you repeat that? 
in the in the theorem, like is the is the cube the cube complex always cat zero or in a cat zero cube complex, the following hold even for even for the first one. This is really true. This theorem is true. <laughs> yeah, 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 the theorem is true, but if you, if you don't assume that the, the cube complex is cat zero. If it's not cat zero, then if it's not cat zero, um, but it's still non-positively curved, for instance, then you could end up with a situation like this. And you'll have a hyperplane. You might sort of know that you want to define your hyperplane. You start off and everything is looking good. Right? And you have this mid-cube and you know, another mid-cube, another mid-cube, another mid-cube, right? And then another mid-cube over here, another mid-cube, and then whoa, you're going to crash into yourself. Bang. And over here we have we, we all know that that orangey red thing is a hyperplane anyway. We know it's true, but it, but it didn't quite satisfy um, the definition. Okay, so it, it, so um, uh, th this can, th this can fail. This can fail, right? If you're careful and you're ruthless about the definitions, but you do get what's called an immersed hyperplane. Wow, that's really fine print. You probably can't see it. Okay? I'm going to talk about these later. They're going to be very important to us later. Okay, so it's good that you've, I think it's good that you brought them up now. Okay. Um, all right, so let's, uh, um, let's get to work over here now. Let's. Gill students were waiting to watch me watch Erase the Blackboard. I didn't hear them giggling about it. Okay. That's gonna be let's let's bring some stuff down. There's a little hook rod. So, sorry about that. Metric. The metric that we will use on a cat zero cube complex Is the taxi cab metric? I think people like to call that the L1 metric. Um, uh, we're not really going to use it a whole lot anyway, but let's be um, conscious of it. Um, it has the distance between um, points equals uh, the length 
of shortest path that is piecewise parallel to axes within cubes. So, um, uh, in, uh, in, in contrast to the picture uh, that we had before, right, where we kind of went across diagonally in order to um, get there quickly, now what we will do now what we will do is we will force ourselves to travel in a very rigid way, <coughs> always staying parallel to the axes. So what did I do? I went from uh, here to there. So in the, in the cat, for the cat zero metric, I don't even want to draw it. I'll just do, make little dots with my fingers. We did it like this. Right? Now what we're going to do is we're going to travel just parallel to the axes. And the length is whatever the sum of the lengths were. And uh, unfortunately, um, we don't have uniqueness of geodesics, right? I told you, you the cat zero inequality actually gives you uniqueness of geodesics, lovely. Um, but now there's, you know, even traveling around a single square, even traveling around within a, a, a single three cube, there are you know, many ways, even if you restrict yourself to traveling in the one skeleton, never mind traveling within the interior of the three cube, there's lots of ways to get as a geodesic from, from one zero cube to the other. But if you like the one skeleton, which I do, you know, there's, <laughs> there's this way and and there's also this way, for instance. Okay? And there are many ways. Right? So here's a pink way. Okay, so it's certainly not a geo, it's, it's not a unique, there aren't unique geodesics, there are geodesics still. Okay. Um, the truth is that uh, I am mostly going to, um, uh, well, almost entirely um, focus on the metric on the one skeleton, it's going to be good enough for our purposes, and the L1 metric, or the taxicab metric, agrees with the usual path metric um, uh, when we just focus on the zero cells. So let me say that, uh, um, let, let me say it in a more uh, 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 cleaner way. induces the same metric on the set of zero cells as the usual path metric. And in particular, uh, um, ge geodesics in the one skeleton between vertices are in are geodesics in either the taxi cab metric or the just the graph metric on the one skeleton. Okay, so to, 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 for the most part, you can just think about the uh, path metric on the one skeleton over here. Yes? Does that mean we're no longer cat zero because we don't have any We are not going to be cat zero. Okay, so unfortunately, we're going to use the word term cat zero cube complex, but we're not going to be using the cat zero metric. Okay, what we are going to use is 
the, the, the enabling condition that the links of zero cubes are flag complexes. That's going to be a very powerful condition, and it's going to control everything that happens over here. Okay? So w when you write x0 tilde, this is the set of zero vertices? No, when I write, uh, uh, yes. Um, so this, this really means that. Okay, but then if you have a square and the two opposite vertices, the, the distance is square root of 2 in the previous metric, and now it is 2. So it is not the same metric. Right. Yes. So you say it induces the same metric. It induces the same metric um, on x total 0 as the usual path metric on the 1 skeleton. The cat 0 metric, forget about it. I am only told you about it because I was pressured to do so by Ruth. <laughs> it's just going to confuse everybody. It's, in fact, in fact, it's beautiful and it's, it's extraordinary that Gromov sort of threw these out as, oh yeah, these are good examples for you guys. Use these non-positively curved cube complexes. They give you many nice cat zero metric spaces. But the cat zero metric in my experience from doing sort of cube, you know, thinking about the cube complex as something that's just about cube complexes, if, you, if, if you're using the cat zero metric and you're, and you're sort of moving more towards traditional combinatorial group theory arguments with, you know, thin triangles and constants and whatever, it turns into a huge mess. But if you just say, I'm only going to use the flag complex link, the, that the links are flag complexes, you support that? All I care about is that cat zero spaces are contractible, and for that I have to use the cat zero metric. No, you don't. You could just use the flat. You could just use the. You, you could. You, you and you also don't. You, it, it also works when there. It also works when there are infinite cubes, as well. Okay, so, you know, it's an, it's interesting to try to. There's there's a sort of theme of combinatorial non-positive curvature, which you know is is alive and kicking right now, and. Uh, We'll see, we'll see wh what wins out the you know, ge geodesic metric non-positive curvature or combinatorial non-positive curvature. It's interesting what's going to happen for art and groups. We shall see. Okay. Um, I think I better go back to my lecture. And uh, where was I? Um, I did the taxi cab metric. I'm going to tell you now about immersed hyperplanes and convexity. Yes, I will. Okay. I'm actually not going to use the metric a whole lot, but uh, uh, it's going to come up uh, for a bit now. Um, uh, an immersed hyperplane in a non-positively curved cube complex you already know what it is. It's, um, let me say it in a slightly more formal way, um, is a component of the space uh, obtained by starting with all of the, with the disjoint union of the mid cubes of cubes of x. And gluing them together by gluing mid cubes of cubes of x together along sub mid cubes. I'll just say along sub cubes. Cubes. So, what is meant over here? Um, Ah, uh, let me move this guy up a little bit. Bring it back down in a moment. Um, let's draw one. Let's let's give myself a ton of space. In fact, they're on the floor because I throw them on the floor, right? Which floor? Oh, they're camouflaged. Okay. They're both, they're, are they both there? Yeah. Cool. Organized. <laughs> I see. 
I need to, to, to I need that guy up. I'll take his friend down and we'll go up. Okay, so here's a picture of immersed hyperplanes. So here's a This is too, too much. Okay, so there's a three-dimensional, non-positively curved cube complex. And um, let me draw uh, some of its immersed hyperplanes, but I'll draw them on the outside. So maybe I'll give myself a little hint to make it easier. I'll take that little square and and I'll start with that. So here's this one. It has that little square. And then there's that one kind of mid-cube that, that was there. And then there's another mid-cube of, of this square, of this three-cube, rather. And it continues on over there. And actually this, the first mid, two-dimensional mid-cube kind of continued like that. And that is one, that is one of my immersed hyperplanes. But there are others, right? There's also, there's, there's also the green one, or the purple one over here. Maybe I'll Add it over here. And it continues like that. And I guess there's another one over here that I forgot about. And I'll put it, I'll put it over here. And there's another one over there that maybe I also forgot about. Okay, and, and perhaps there's one more that I also forgot about. There's three more that I forgot about. And the definition seems to require <coughs> that you have to continue going as far as possible. Yes, yes. And um, in, in fact, uh, I think you all know what they are now. In fact, if you had taken the universal cover and you looked at the hyperplanes in the universal cover and then you quotiented them by their, their stabilizers under the, fundament, under the action of the fundamental group, <coughs> right? then the, the components that you get when you quotient are going to be these, these, these immersed hyperplanes. Right? The objects that you get when you quotient the hyperplanes in the universal cover by their stabilizers are going to be these immersed hyperplanes. But you can think of that about them downstairs in the base space just by just, just collecting all of the mid-cubes that are living inside, right? just the disjoint union of all of these mid-cubes glued together in the obvious whenever, whenever they should be glued together because they share a sub-mid cube. And if you do that, you'll get this. Right, so, um, okay. So now we know what immersed hyperplanes are. Okay, and they're going to be very important uh, for us. Um, as, as for hyperplanes themselves, they have what, what we might call carriers. So these are immersed hyperplanes. Right? And they come equipped with, with maps, they're components. They come equipped with, a, with, a, with this map. Um, the carrier uh, 
um, NV of one of these of an immersed hyperplane, you probably know what it is. You just kind of thicken it up. It's is the cube complex <coughs> obtained by gluing uh, together ambient cubes. instead of mid-cubes. OK, so um, uh, well, I guess uh, in this picture over here, there would actually be um, that purple, that purple uh, um, the purple hyperplane is actually living inside of this carrier right over here. Right, and likewise the the, the others. Okay, I'm not going to I'm not I'm not going to draw them all. And and usually they look just like products, but not always. It could be a little more complicated than that. Okay, are you are you good on what the carriers of Hyperplanes are, yes, of immersed hyperplanes. The orange red picture is the, what's the carrier? Is it going to be simply connected or is <coughs> Okay, so let's, so let's draw it because it's self-crossed. It, it, I, 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 I'm going to draw it. It looks like this. Okay, maybe it wasn't drawn in a way that makes that makes the embedding so clear, but it doesn't matter. You'll you'll deal with it. I think it looks like looks like this. And I'm not going to draw it as red and orange because give me a break here. Okay? Oh, I can't control myself. <coughs> All right? So every, uh, uh, an n cube is going to kind of make appearances n times among these, uh, within the carriers of all of the, uh, of all of these immersed hyperplanes. Right? Once for each of its mid cubes. All right. So, um, Hmm. Now let's let's check some important things. The, the orders of the the orders of the lectures is important because we are in lecture three. Yes, that's a disaster. Hmm, we are in trouble. Where is, where are my disk diagrams? Not here, not here. Not here. Ah, here. We will go with the flow. It's going to be OK. All right, so we mentioned uh, immersed, immersed hyperplanes. Um, yes? If you are already in nature three, we can just take it. No, no, that's not necessary. So you. You say that it is not always a. Uh, a product, the, the carrier. Okay, you want an example? Okay, so, um, uh,
You've seen this example. I forgot what it's called. You've seen this. <laughs> yes? All right? OK. We will return to it. It's important. OK? Now we know immersed hyperplanes, and it worked out for us. Let's talk about disk diagrams now. Wait, no, I'm confused. I thought the, the carrier lived in the universal cover. So why isn't the carrier of this an infinite string of squares? Because this is the carrier of an immersed hyperplane. And that was the carrier of a hyperplane in the universal cover. This is consistent with the definition that we gave before, it turns out, right? But there, you have to know various things. You have to believe that hyperplanes exist and embed and so forth. Okay, so so you, you pull apart things only when they're different hyperplanes in the projection. Okay, uh, so, uh, tell me, what are you asking? Are you asking, uh, what are you asking me to tell you? Are you asking about the definition of, an, of the carrier of an immersed hyperplane? Well, maybe just of an immersed hyperplane. I guess I... You're asking what, an, what is an immersed hyperplane? So the reason why you get two distinct orange and red ones there is because they're distinct, they have distinct projections. If um, they project into the... Exact... Uh, there's, I never use the word projection. So you're looking at the, 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 the red and orange mid-cubes over there inside of that three cube? Yeah. Okay, so the, um, if you take all of, so, I, 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 so we, we intuitively defined what, a, what a, an immersed hyperplane is to start with, and then I t t you know, gave you a hint about how to make a, a rigorous definition. The hint of the rigorous definition is that you take all of the mid-cubes, you take their disjoint union, and then you, you, you glue them together. Really, it's enough to identify um, sub-mid-cubes of mid-cubes that will perform all of the gluings that you want. Okay? And, well, that three-cube is going to, in this sort of ri rigorous definition, that three cube contributes three mid cubes, a purple, an orange, and a red. And they're going to live in, well, these two happen to lie in the same immersed hyperplane, right? And this one lies in another. You're good now? I, I move forward. <coughs> a disk diagram. Were disk diagrams defined in this conference? So a disk diagram is a compact, contractible, two complex, let's call it D, with a planar embedding. But you know what? Let's put it in the two sphere. Here are some examples of disk diagrams. And you know what? I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, stick to um, disk diagrams that are built from squares, because that's what we're going to be focusing on. And here's just a tree. There's a single point we sometimes call the disk diagram trivial. Okay, these are all. Two cells, okay? And these are compact, contractible, two complexes, and I've embedded it in the plane in a very particular way. The boundary path um, of the disk diagram D, or boundary cycle, is the attaching map of the two cell, of the two sphere containing infinity. Right, there's the point at infinity, haha. -ha. And if you um, look at the two cell containing the point at infinity, then it, it has an attaching map. And here it is. Right? That's, the, that's the boundary of the, right, there's the, the, there's the whole two cell right over there, and there it is. That's its boundary cycle. Right? And likewise here. I, didn't, I, didn't, I, I guess I didn't really need the, to, to use this sort of nifty def way of, 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 of catching it, but it, it, it's useful for this guy there, because there's more than one embedding. There's more than one embedding of this two complex in the, in the two sphere. This one basically has only one, only one embedding, right? There's that, and then you, know, you can reverse the orientation. And this has many embeddings. 
And so you really, in order, well, you could say that if, if, you, had if you had declared what the boundary cycle was, right, and well, I, I'm, I'm not going to be fussy about the orientation. Okay, here are the, the trivial, trivial boundary path. Okay, um, it is a uh, famous fact, famous theorem of Van Kampen uh, that was long overlooked, which, which says that for any closed null homotopic um, path, um, P to X, this is going to be a, say, a two complex or a complex, um, there exists um, a disk diagram D and actually a map from D to X uh, such that um, P is the boundary path of D. Okay, what, is, what do I mean? I mean, well, if it's a very nice way of, of, of uh, uh, seeing the null homotopy, so we know that null homotopy means that it factors through a, a, a disk on the way in, but this, there's, a, there's a more combinatorial um, uh, this map is a com and, a, and a combinatorial map and a combinatorial map. So com a, 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 a map between cell complexes is called combinatorial if it sends open cells homeomorphically to open cells. Right? So it's cells, one cell go to one cell, two cells go to two cells by homeomorphisms. Okay? A very, very nice map. So you have some complex, some, 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 some complex, some, something really messy and complicated, and uh, you have a path P, and, it's, and you know that it's null homotopic. Well, you can actually see that it's null homotopic by, by exhibiting it as the, as the boundary path of, of some disk diagram. And of course, if, it, if P factors through this disk diagram on the way to X, then P is null homotopic. And actually, it's basically a simplicial approximation theorem. If you have a null homotopy, right, so you're factoring through a, a disk, but it's really a topological thing that's happening, you can adjust and, and choose and actually factor through a disk which is kind of tessellated, right? And it, you know, oftentimes it's, an, it's still homeomorphic to a disk, but sometimes it will have singularities to it. Where these are called singular points. So it won't really, this isn't really homeomorphic to a disk. Right? It, 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 has cut, it has cut points. All right. So um, we're going to use this. We're going to use this. Uh, excuse me? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to, um, uh, uh, <coughs> of course, once you, w w once you start with this, you, you're, you're, you're interested in minimal diagrams, minimal disk diagrams have a fewest um, uh, cells. Usually people focus on the number of two cells. And they call that the area of the disk diagram. Among all uh, disk diagrams with a given boundary path. So the combinatorial group theorists view this disk diagram as the proof that P is null homotopic.
they view the, this disk diagram, and you can actually think of it as encoding the, 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 the path P as the product of conjugates of relators, if you're thinking about a group presentation, right, if you've seen this before. Um, and, well, we like short proofs, so we prefer to uh, um, find a minimal size disk diagram that shows you that it's no homotopic. Okay. Now, if you're working in a cube complex, Um, when d to x is a disk diagram in a cube complex, um, d is a square diagram. Right? It's going to just be mapping into the two skeleton. And we're going to focus on its immersed hyperplanes are called dual curves. So let's, uh, let's give a picture that will explain all of this. There, there's a disk diagram right over there. I don't know if it's minimal or not. I didn't check. And you already know what, to, what, what these dual curves are. They're just what we would have called immersed hyperplanes. Here's a dual curve right over here. There's a red one. And here's a, here's a uh, yellow one. And maybe there's a, a green one to test the green on green theory. Okay? So everybody knows what dual curves are now. And um, these dual curves are kind of, they're carriers are ladders. Right, so, um, uh, uh, for, for example, the, the carrier of the yellow dual curve looks like this. Let's see, it looks like a ladder, crooked ladder. Okay. Um, and, well, I guess in principle, they could be cylinders. look like this also. Right? That could happen. No, because it's in a disk diagram. And the disk diagram is a, con is a contractible <coughs> two complex. Yeah, but you said it was in a cube complex. D is a disk diagram Mapping to a cube complex. Yeah, you take the carrier in D, not in X. The, right, that's correct. Okay. okay. We um, so the lingo, unfortunately, the lingo is a map from a disk diagram. So the disk diagram is living inside of the plane, and when we say a disk diagram in X, we mean a map from that disk diagram to X. Okay, and we're talking now about the um, the the 
these dual curves, right, which are these immersed hyperplanes in the disk diagram. So it's just two-dimensional cube complex over here. So let's st um, uh, um, let's state a, a quick theorem. that um, um, if d to x is a minimal area diagram, this diagram, then d has no, and there's four configurations that we want to draw your attention to. It has none of these. And its statements about how its statements really about the carriers of dual curves. This is the most important. There are no bygones. So I'll even say no bygones. Okay? Um, so uh, let's. Mm, there's a there's a little furthermore that's interesting, but I kind of leave it out over here. Let's talk. So I have two minutes plus the three minutes because I had to erase the blackboard on my own, right? What else do I got? I don't have a lot, huh? Yeah, so it works that way. It works that way. Whatever I want, no. That's, that's Friday. So, um, <laughs> so um, uh, let's talk about the, I'm going to describe the method of proof, but I have to sort of um, be, uh, um, uh, I, I have to um, tell you maybe where, how the story fits together. What we're going to find is that, eh, well, here goes. Method of proof. Indira made me do this. Um, hexagon moves. So if you ever see if you ever see this either of either of these configurations inside of your disk diagram, you could swap it and replace it with the other, right? Because if you see one of these, there's actually a three cube inside of the cube complex, right? And you could you could you could you could take that disk diagram and you could push it across the three cube to get a slightly different disk diagram. Okay. Um, and there's another important thing that you might do. If you ever see, if you ever see two squares in your disk diagram that are meeting along a path of length two, they're forced, since the link is a flag complex, they're forced to map to the same square inside of X. You didn't mention there, but it's not positive in are oh, you kidding me? That's not over there. It's over here. Thank you. Um, if if you have a, uh, a a pair of squares that are meeting along two edges, right? then those squares have to map to the same square inside of the cube complex x. Why is that? Well, the, um, the link, these two corners of those squares, have to map to uh, the same corner of a square uh, um, in, 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 uh, at the image of this white vertex over here. 
right? And, there's, and, and the links are flag complexes, so there's only one edge joining two points in the link. Okay? So if you ever see two squares that are meeting along a, a, a pair of edges in, inside of a disk diagram, they have to map to the same square in X. But that means that, well, you could just, it, it, what, what it means is that these two, um, uh, that these two edges are the same as these two edges. So if you ever have this, then you could have just cut it out of the disk diagram and replaced it with that. And so your disk diagram, which, which has this, what's called a cancelable pair, can be made smaller by just doing this simple replacement. Okay, this is a very important notion in combinatorial uh, group theory. Right over here as well, if you have a disk diagram that contains this picture, you can replace it by a disk diagram that contains exactly that picture because these two hexagons, these two hexagons have the same boundary path. Okay, so I am going to um, stop now, which is an incredible uh, display of self-control. Yeah, uh, thanks. Good self-control.